listening to another powerful message from C3 Southwest Washington. We are so excited you're here with us, and we believe God has more in store for you. great time to be in church, gathered together as a church family and as families to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the one who's reached into our life with his goodness and his greatness. And while you're standing there, we're in a series entitled uh, Jesus Came, and he did. We see that picture of the manger, which is probably not 100% reality. I don't, I'm not sure there was a carpet beneath the manger, nor was there necessarily trees in the background. Um, and, but however it took place, we know that it did take place. As you observe this manger with this child born, I've been trying to emphasize to you over the last several weeks that this is more than just a baby being born, although every baby that's born is a wonderful, miraculous gift from God. Life is to be treasured and protected at all, at all extent. Uh, we fight for the well-being of the people in this world, people coming into this world, people leaving this world. Um, but this child being born in this manger is a starting point. It's like, gentlemen, start your engines of something that's been promised for generations to come. This manger represents the plan of God now being activated, something that was promised that has been released and now being propelled into our lives. It's the fix for the problem that was caused by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned and this whole world twisted off its axis as it was intended to function, as we were intended to relate with God, as our lives were intended to flow in the best that God had created them to experience. But that sin not only affected Adam and Eve, but it also ripples down into our lives. The life that you've experienced is not the life that God intended. I don't know if you realize that, but it's not the life that you intended. Now, we'll fight for the best that we can in this lifetime, and that's one of the reasons this manger exists. But you have to recognize that there has been an attack on the very plan of God. But the fix for the problem was, is represented here in the manger. It's the solution for sin and death, and Jesus, he came. One of the reasons that he came that I wanna draw your attention to this morning comes out of 1 John chapter 3 and verse eight. It says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Come on, so, anybody ever experienced the works of the devil in your life? Yes. I mean, if we could all see all the scars, the reason, come on, repeat this with me. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I think that either you need a quick shock with a taser or you need to punch your neighbor in the arm or you need to take a look at the value of this portion of scripture. Read it with me for what it's intended to say. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Do I need to read it again? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy. Okay, well, it sounds like it's getting bumped into. I'm not sure about destroy. But by the time we get to the end, my expectation is you have an expectation to see the works of the enemy destroyed in your life. Destroy doesn't mean they didn't happen, but the Bible in that word uses that Greek word destroy is the concept to loose something that's been bound, to release something that's been held captive, or to dissolve something that's been built in your life to keep you from experiencing all that God has for you. Amen? So let me pray for you, Father. And in the title of my message is, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We lean into the scripture right now. Give us hearts to hear, and Lord, help our faith to increase. That was something the disciples prayed. There were times where they didn't have the faith to believe what you were saying, and the prayer came out of one of the disciples' mouth, Lord, help me believe. Help me, help my faith to increase. And so we pray, Lord, our faith will increase for this concept because we don't want to miss out one of the primary reasons why you came. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and everyone said amen and amen. High five the person next to you. Give the Lord a big hand before you're seated, and we will give the high five and clap. All right. Wow, we got to work on our dance moves today. We're a little out of rhythm. We're going to get this worked out. 
Uh, I do want to just reemphasize our Vision Builder Soiree. Uh, there is a $20 discount right now until the 18th. So if you get signed up now, you'll be able to save a little bit of money. But don't miss this particular evening. It's one of our iconic evenings. It's a black tie event. You'll walk. This place won't look like it. It looks. We'll be able to celebrate all that the Lord did this last year in our church family's life and look forward to 2023, what he's planning on doing and how we can partner together for that. Um, also, if you are even remotely interested in our C3 internship, please come and see me after the gathering. We've got about another, I think it's another week to get signed up. The deadline's really not till the uh, second week of January, but you want to get started on time. You don't want to be behind. Uh, we've done some adjustment on the schedule that was advertised to be able to accommodate more people so it'll be a better fit. Um, but this is our pipeline for helping some of you have real passion to grow in ministry skill, leadership skill, involvement, impact on building God's house. This is where we take a year to work with you. Uh, it's Rowena and I personally to be able to invest in you on a weekly basis, partner you with another ministry leader and help you to step in to your skill set. And uh, everyone would... would, uh, would uh, uh, take advantage of this. It would be valuable to you. I know not everybody can. So this would be for people who are already disciples. We want to be able to help disciple you on a higher level so that you can be more effective in the house of God. And this is where our, the pipeline from which our leaders definitely grow from, okay? Um, how many of you, you just absolutely love the holidays? Let me see your hands. Come on, big cheer. Uh, let me ask a tougher question, but I want you to be honest. How many of you, you find the holidays to be a little bit of a challenge for whatever reason? See some hands going up. I know for me, I can raise my hands on both sides. I love the holidays. That's why we start setting up the tree at the beginning of sometimes before even Thanksgiving. I know that's sinful uh, probably for some of you, but um, I, I, I love a lot of the aspects of the holidays. But as I mentioned last week, for me, the holidays have traditionally been a bit difficult because of some of my upbringing, some of the family experiences that I've had. There were a lot of tensions in our family as our family, larger families came together and interacted. I had a grandfather who had an, a couple of brothers, but he was estranged from them. And so one of my early childhood memories was being at a family member's house where my grandfather was and a, the owner of the house, the man, was missing. And then my grandfather left for a little while. And this man, who I hardly knew, sh showed up. And then he left after a little while, and my grandfather came back. There's obviously some sort of conflict there amongst the brothers and their upbringing. They had rippled through the next 50 years. And when there are things like that in families and in relationships, uh, they have a, have a way of imprinting on that season and causing the season or fighting to see the season be less than it would be. I had a memory probably from about the fifth grade where we were in a Christmas candlelight gathering at our church. I was, that was back in the day where they allowed us to walk in actually with a lit candle as a child. I mean, what could go wrong there? And we went through the Christmas and the you know, wax is dripping every place. And my family, we would literally get in our Volkswagen, not the best for uh, protection from fuel fumes, okay? And with our candles lit, would drive to my grandparents' house in the car. Okay, this is before helmets and safe spaces, I assure you. And uh, wax would be every place, and our Volkswagen had a hole in the floor, and I will promise you that many things got shoved out the hole in the floor, and we'd look out the back window as kids to see it tumble, and maybe a candle or two went down that chute during the holiday season. But during that season, I had an aunt who was in the hospital in a coma, and she had been a part of a domestic abuse situation. And so there on that Christmas Eve, while we were singing about this beautiful manger and all that goes along with it, I was experiencing some of that uh, difficulty of this season that's supposed to be so wonderful is not going so wonderful for me. And so now even many years later after she's since passed away, those types of emotions want to creep back into the holidays. I wanna challenge you, this is, a, this is a, a season to fight for the reason why Jesus came. And I'm not saying that you won't experience some of those emotions and be aware that others experience those emotions. But when I get up in the morning and I feel that darkness want to press in from those memories, from those feelings, from those experiences, it's like the holidays are like a, like a, a smell. There's a fragrance and there's memories that come back to it. And I can't help that once a tree gets set up, there are a number of negative memories that come and begin to knock at the door of, of my psyche. But I fight back because I don't want to be robbed from the reason for the season or all of the new memories that can be created. 
It was just a few years ago where my family was at our house, all three of our adult children, our daughter-in-law, who's our fourth child, and uh, we had one grandson at the time. Uh, Mary was extremely pregnant, but she was a couple weeks away from her due date. We opened, uh, we didn't open gifts that evening. It was, we didn't open gifts that evening. It was, I think they were over to eat that day, Christmas day. And uh, everything was normal. I think they left about one o'clock in the afternoon. And she was very pregnant, but still a couple weeks out of her due date. And about four o'clock, I think we got a text message that said, uh, we're on the way to the hospital. We we're like, what? We were just eating well, how did, how did that happen? And then about 15 minutes later, congratulations, Benjamin Levi was born. We, we didn't even have a chance to transition out of Turkey to, to grandchild coming. And so, so there are great things that also come in during the season. I really feel for Ben. I mean, how would you like to be born on the day Jesus is celebrated as being born? Hey, here's a gift for you, kid. Uh, by the way, this is Christmas and your birthday. You know, that's going to work that way. Imagine passing out birthday cards, you know, and Jesus is your classmate, and he's you've got the same birthday as him. <laughs> Which party are you, are you going to, right? There's that challenge. Um, anyways, to, to our topic, uh, that verse behind me, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's a whole lot of works. Uh, and we see in John 10, 10, Jesus kind of takes a, a, a sentence to really quantify what are the works of the devil. Now, there's far more, but this just really sums up what his initial intent is. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so as we look out in the world, as we look at our lives, there have been moments where the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and he's been very effective at it. And Jesus has come to undo those things. I want to give you just really briefly, as you look at these verses, a quick theology or or doctrinal uh, walk through the park about Satan and who he is. You know, the Bible is a lot like a giant box of puzzle pieces. How many of you, when you put together a puzzle, what's the first thing you look for in the, in the box? Edges. edges, right? You get the edges over here in a pile. And then there's, there's like maybe an American flag. You get the red, white, and blue stuff in a pile. And maybe over here, there's a, a nice white Ford F-350 in the picture. You're like, yeah, baby. Okay, so that you get the white pieces over there. And, and you try to divide everything up. Doctrine and theology is much the same way because the Bible is like a box of puzzle pieces, but they can be assembled together in like pieces piles. And if you actually start at the beginning of the Bible, you can learn a lot about Satan, but there are like pieces here and there that begin to show up. But once you get all those pieces in a pile, it's amazing what you can understand about anything in the Bible, anything about Jesus, anything about sin, anything about the Holy Spirit, anything about redemption, anything about heaven or angels, or in this case, Satan. So really quick, yes, we see Satan in the Garden of Eden at the beginning with Adam and Eve. And the Bible shows him interacting with Eve and having a discussion and twisting God's words. Like we said in the very beginning, he's come to steal, kill, and destroy One of his great ways of doing that is to manipulate people through lies, to whisper half-truths and untruths. But we see him mentioned as to being in the Garden of Eden in the book of Ezekiel, which is a prophetic book. Ezekiel is prophesying about the king of Tyree, and in so doing, he begins to start attributing characteristics to that king that are not quantifiable to any living person. And so what what Ezekiel is doing is he's prophesying to that king, but he's really prophesying to the thing that's motivating that king, Satan at work behind him. And he goes on to say there in that chapter, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, this is Ezekiel 28, thousands of years after the garden of Eden, and yet he's saying the king of Tyre was in the garden, but he wasn't because he's speaking through the king about Satan. And there in that chapter, a number of things are revealed, verses 11 through 19, but he begins to talk about what Satan really looked like. And he says there, you were the signet of perfection, Anything created by God is the signet of perfection, but especially his angelic host, especially as you learn the top three archangels, we see that Satan or Lucifer being one of them, these are the things that are said about his origins. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of the fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until, 
unrighteousness was found in you. In the abund- this is fascinating. It applies to today's economies and the world economy we're dealing with, but it shows that part of Satan's responsibility had to do with commerce. It's amazing. It says here, in the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and then you sinned. So I cast you, this is, this is fascinating. So I cast you as profane, as a profane thing from the mountain of God. Satan literally thrown from the mountain of God or the heavenlies of God, cast down and I destroyed you. Um, goes on to say, I cast you to the ground and I exposed you before kings. Now, Isaiah the prophet, a contemporary of Ezekiel, who also was prophesying against kingdoms, he also prophesies about Satan, but while prophesying about an existing king. But his wording again is, there's no way this applies to a man because it's got such deeper meanings to it that no man could fulfill. And he says in chapter 14, which by the way, chapter 14 is iconic. It's, it's the description of Satan all throughout this chapter, although it's about a king. And he says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn or son of light. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven above the stars of God. Stars of God are angels, symbolically in the book of Revelation. I will ascend above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly as far reaches to the north. I will ascend the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Fascinating. And so you begin to discover Satan's origins, his perfection, but something turned inside of him and he was cast down. Now, Jesus reveals, or actually the book of Revelation, which is much later, but John prophesying about future and past, he gives this explanation that kind of gives you this incredible picture about God dealing with Satan. And it says, and in Revelation chapter 12, and another sign appeared in the heavens. Behold, a great red dragon, talking about the same being, with seven heads, ten horns, and the head and the heads seven diadems. His tail, now listen to this, his tail swept down a third of the stars from heaven and cast them down to the earth. And you get this picture as Satan is thrown to the earth, removed from the mountain of God, his tail sweeps a third of the angels with him. And the dragon, this is this is fascinating. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. There's a woman about to give birth. Now, lots of women have, been, have given birth, right? This talks about the woman who is about to give birth. Talking about the promised one, the woman who would conceive from the Holy Spirit and give birth to the Son of God. The dragon stood before the woman. You know, the enemy is most vicious before the things of God even get started. The reason why some of you have experienced intense childhood trauma is because that's your most formative years. And if you could take a child's knees out while they're young, they'll be crippled for the rest of their life, potentially. And so the enemy wanted to take out this woman's child. In fact, you know that God's, or the devil stirred up the heart of, of Herod. And what did he have done? He, he had all of the male children under age two in all of that area, that region of where Jesus was born, had them mutilated while Jesus fled at nighttime. His parents took him into Egypt. It goes on to say, the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Wow. All the Bible beginning to end. Oh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Oh boy, it laces all together very well. And it says, she gave birth to a male child. Hmm, who could this be? His name is? Okay, three of you got it. Good job. His name is? Jesus. Say it like you mean it. His name is? Can you see the hatred that this being has for Jesus? Because this Jesus is the one who is exalted high in the heavenlies, the one that he desired to be and yet will never be because he's an angel. And yet the one who took the spot that he desired, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he hates with a passion. Why is it that uh, when you watch TV that so many, so many cuss words could be bleeped out, but Jesus' name is never bleeped out? How come there are no cuss words surrounding the names of any other false prophet or any other God? And yet in every culture, every language, what's a common curse word? Jesus. 
And the way Jesus' name is used, he's given middle names that I don't know that he had. Initials, H, I, don't, I grew up thinking Jesus, middle name was probably Henry because I had relatives that were Jesus and, it, you know, they'd go through it. And Jesus also had some other additional middle names that were bad words. I thought that's kind of strange, but that is it. I've been in insane asylums to visit patients and there's nobody running around screaming out the name of Allah or Buddha or anything else, but it's always twisted versions of Jesus and Christianity. There's an intense, deep hatred in the psyche of the world, and I'll explain a little farther why, but it comes out of this. There is deep hatred. He, he stood before the woman as she bore her child that he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to the throne. Amen? Amen. He desired to take Jesus out, but Jesus ascended the rightful way to the throne. And it goes on to say the woman fled into the wilderness, and it's talking about the Jewish nation. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus' words. Disciples go out. They're casting out demons. They come back, Jesus, man, you gave us authority, and we're casting out demons. Woo! High-fiving one another. And Jesus said, that's nothing. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw him cast down. I was there. I wasn't just born in the manger. I am. Jesus has always been. He wasn't conceived in a moment while his body was made manifest and he set aside all of his power to walk as a man. He has always existed. He was there. He was the one who cast Satan down off of that holy mountain. And so we see that hatred exist. Now, a couple little other pieces of the edge here on on the dialogue about Satan that you better understand, okay? And I think it's pretty phenomenal. Jesus um, was taken up to, in, in a vision sense, at the beginning of his ministry. Again, the enemy is most active either at just before you get launched to do something great or just after you've succeeded. Those are the two key spots to watch for it. When I experience intense temptation or intense frustration or intense whatever, and I sense it's an attack of the enemy, I, I smile because I'm like, oh, God's going to do something good. I could just tell. There would not be this kind of fight if God wasn't going to do something really good. And so just before Jesus starts his ministry, Luke chapter 4, the devil takes him up and shows him, listen to this, all the kingdoms of the world compressed into one moment of time. That includes America, European bloc, Russia, and and all the Slavic kingdoms from time past back to when it all first started in the garden. The enemy shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he says to him, I will give you this authority and their glory. I will give you authority over these kingdoms and the glory of these kingdoms. Fascinating. Fascinating. For, now this is, listen to this, for it has been delivered to me. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God owns it all, but he does not possess it all right now. I don't know if you understand that. Maybe this will help you to understand why do bad things in the world, why do they happen? Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave all authority to rule the earth to the one who tempted them. That's what happened. And some of you in your mind, you think, well, why does God allow these things to happen? Look, if you, if you have a property manager where you are renting, that property manager can make your life miserable even though he's not the owner. And maybe the owner doesn't, is not even around, and yet this property manager is really working you over. It could be very frustrating, but he has control, rightfully so. It's been given to him. All the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time, and he says to him, I will give you all the authority and the glory, for it has been delivered to me, and check this out, and I give it to whom I will. That is some serious stuff right there. That's serious stuff right there. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this about Satan and us and the people of the world. It says, in their case, talking about people who are not serving God, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. 
the God of this world. Now understand the title, the God of this world. It is the one who is ruling and reigning on this earth, not over everyone, because he doesn't rule and reign over my life. Every place my foot steps because I've surrendered to the kingdom of God, the kingdom goes with me. God spoke to Abram and said to Abram, wherever your foot goes will be blessed. Why? Because you belong to me. And stepping into the kingdom of God, receiving the King Jesus means that I carry the kingdom of God with me. I am not under the authority of the wicked one, but if your life is not surrendered to that king, then the God of this world is your king, whether you like it or not. There are people right now trapped in kingdoms who don't like their king and must follow their king's rules. Why does that exist? Because they continue to remain in that kingdom. Wouldn't it be great if there was a, a super portal that opened up and allowed them to escape? Yes, and there is one, and his name is Jesus. Yeah. You're able to step out of the kingdom of darkness and the God of this world who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. It amazes me that people are worried about, if I give my life to Jesus, what's he, he's, what's he gonna do to me? What's already happening to you? Look in the rearview mirror. There's a lot of stealing, killing, and destroying, and he's come to give you life. I don't even know if I'm going to get to my message. Come on. It refers to him as the God of this world. It says, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I used to be blind. To keep them from seeing something, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He was my former prince, I hate to lay claim to that, but it's true. From the time I was born until the moment I met Jesus, Ephesians 2, 2 says this, that of me and of all of us uh, who, who are now believers, it says, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. I had no idea I was following a prince of the air. I had no idea, but my life was submitted underneath him because that's the kingdom I was born into. And ultimately, he is not a gracious king. He is an enemy king because 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, this king, this prince of the air, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, not to build up his members of his kingdom, but he's looking to, to unleash and to devour them. And it reminds us as believers in this world, that when he comes knocking on our kingdom door, that we are to resist him, stand firm in our faith, knowing that all believers suffer this type of uh, struggle, but that God has overcome the world. Amen. Final thing about these puzzle pieces, and I think I have three minutes left to preach, so <laughs> sheesh. I don't want to finish this on Christmas morning, man. This is <laughs> Christmas season, what's your pastor preach on? The devil. <laughs> I think if you understand the enemy, you will appreciate more your victory. Yes. Sometimes we just don't really, we, we, we want to blame, this is the thing you got to hear from this message. We want to blame the stuff that has happened to us on people that we can see with our eyes. And the problem is, is, as long as that's all we understand, we will hold those constructs hostage in our life and allow them to exist in our world. They did this to me, this happened to me, and not realizing that behind the scenes, this was the working of the enemy. And once you see it for what it is, the working of the enemy, you want that thing to be broken. You want that thing to be dissolved. You want that thing to release its hold over your life because it's intended to keep you from what God has for you. And so you rise up and say, yeah, well, that happened, but Jesus has set me free. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus let it, reminded the disciples that eternal fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. First Corinthians, and I'll, I'll bring this slide up so that you can see it behind me. I love this portion of scripture. First Corinthians 15, 20, or it says second Corinthians, whichever. <laughs> it's the right verse. I don't know why the reference. Somebody look it up and let me know. Then comes the end. How many are you looking forward to the end? Yeah. Not the end of all things, the end of this garbage. Yeah. The end of this hassle, the end of this destruction, the end of the lies, the end of the deception, the end of the death, the end of the murder, the end of the thievery, the end of the hardship, the end of the brokenheartedness, the end of unanswered prayers, the end of frustrations, and, and all the struggle, the trouble that we have in this world. Then comes the end. 
when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign, and right now he does reign. But it says he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. You have to understand, you're in the, we are in the process of putting his enemies under our feet, yes. under his feet. It's a process. Everything Christ did was completed on his resurrection, but he partners with us to see that resurrection applied to our lives and the world around us, and we are in the process, a step at a time, putting the enemies underneath our feet. Every time you respond to scripture, every time you allow God to adjust your thought process, every time you abandon a lie for the truth of what God says, you are putting the enemy underneath your feet. You're putting another structure, another weapon formed against you that will not prosper. You are placing it under your feet. You are crushing it. And God's throne is being established in your life and in the world that you live in. Is this okay? Okay. Okay, so he must reign until... He has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is what? Serious sober moment. Death is not the plan of God. It wasn't time for grandma to come home, so he sent his angels to get her. Death is an enemy. It's the enemy of God. It's the enemy of his people. It is unfortunately part of the curse of the world that we live in. But make no mistake, it's not a time where God brings one of his trophies home. It's not a time where God needed somebody more in heaven than he needed them on earth. This is a moment where the enemy strikes his final blow. Now, I'm not afraid of that moment because I know there will be grace in that moment. And I know that it is the thin veil that separates this side from the perfection of God. I kind of, I don't, when I say I look forward to it, I'm not hoping for it right now. But man, to be released from this body and step into all the promises of God, I say, come Jesus, come. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, there's somebody clapped. Who was that? Good high five on my Rowena. She's, <laughs> of course, female Jesus clapped at that. All right. Um, by the way, pray for her. The struggle with the puppies is real. More for her than me. Uh, they're just so cute. They just tumble over each other. They get no traction on our floor. They slobber. But Rowena is someone who... Her home is her space of perfection. And how many of you know puppies will infringe on that? (laughs) They're doing just that. They're doing well, though. Okay. Uh, Satan has been working in your life from before the moment you were born. And some of you are not really aware of that. You look at circumstances and situations and things happened and you you really want to look at some of the people, some of the players of the, of the whole drama that you were injected into, and you really want to look at them because why did they do this, or why didn't they do that, or how come they couldn't work things out, or how come he quit, or how come he made that decision? Why couldn't he see how stupid that is? How come they couldn't get along? How come they split up? How come they, he quit his job? There's so many things we would say about the people in our lives, but you have to understand there's an infrastructure that has been woven in your life and in the generations before you. Jesus came to destroy those things. And figuratively, yes, he's talking about the final demise of all these things. But in reality, Jesus came to destroy the works that have impacted your life for less. Now, the truth is he cannot remove the reality of what has happened because they have happened. And some of them, those structures of what happened still exist in your life. And this is not a pretend they don't belong there. But Jesus came to loose, to dissolve, or to set free those structures negatively infringing on your life to remove what God originally intended. We can't make those things go away. There's no magic wand to make them disappear. But at the same time, We recognize that Jesus entering in on the scene, and as we partner with him, those things can be redeemed. Some of the very worst things that have ever happened to you with God's touch on them can become a part of the rocket fuel that propels you beyond where you would ever go in this lifetime on your own. Supernaturally, not self-help, although your participation will be required, God can take the things that have been done to you, that you experienced, that you were born into, and even things that you've done, and redeem them in a way to, to catapult you into his very best, where you can walk in them, 
where you can thrive in them and those things that were meant to destroy you can now be the weapon in your hand that you help others with. Let me give you a couple real quick points. I think we're still pretty good on time. Um, you know, the, the uh, I'm only three minutes over, but I'm now into the altar time and the farewell. So I might steal somebody else's time maybe. Um, okay, let me go real quick. Jesus came to destroy the works, negatively impacting your beginnings. The enemy built a nuanced set of siege works in your life that included generational sin, generational spiritual issues, generational financial issues, generational health issues, circumstances, social constructs, and all sorts of injustices. And our world is talking a lot right now about all the injustices and how to make those right. I listened to recently, there was some discussion about reparations to uh, Native Americans, and it is a terrible thing that's happened in this nation to Native Americans. And, and the reality is every nation ever formed, that has been the pathway into which they have formed up until these modern times. These are injustices. But the reality of these injustices is these injustices are stacked on previous injustices. And if you're really gonna bring reparations back, you need to go all the way back to the garden of when Cain killed his brother. Do you understand that? I listened to one Native American lady say, yeah, reparations for Native Americans, but do you understand we were hostile to one another and it was the strongest of the tribes that survived. I'm not making excuses for what took place. Man will always try to solve injustices. Only God can bring true justice. Right. See, the justice of the cross, what it does is it doesn't give you something that you missed out on. It creates a level ground so that you can walk in harmony with God and that becomes your starting point. Right. There's no amount of money that the government can ever give a person. And I'm not saying that the government shouldn't at times maybe... I, I'm, I'm not going to say that. I just can't say it because the irresponsible nature. Of, am I getting political? Yes. Okay. The irresponsible nature of just handing out money is ridiculous. It's, it's, it's not a solution. When we go to foreign countries like Oaxaca, one of the books that we read is called Toxic Charity. It's the idea if you just give money to situations, it will many times make the situation worse. I, money doesn't solve anything. It solves something, but not everything and mo not most things. And so what happens in this, this idea of Jesus came to destroy the works negatively impacting your beginnings is he comes in to dissolve some of this negative stuff that's happened to you and I and bring us down at a level starting point, which is the relationship with God, which is the, the thing that needed to be there the most. And when you start off with a relationship with God, I don't care what construct you were born into, with God at the helm, you can overcome anything that has come into your life. Amen? Amen. It, you can overcome poverty. You can overcome generational sin. You can overcome anything. For those of you who maybe been born into a situation and maybe been fostered out of it or adopted out of it, I wanna encourage you, a relationship with God will help you to not repeat the mistakes of the past generation. Anybody, when you were a kid, you said, I'll never be like my family. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> but we all have, let's be honest. I, was, I just saw a teenager. Ah, I say that all the time. <laughs> you do? We've all said it. And how many of you at about age 18 or 19, by the time you were starting to become an adult, you realize you're becoming the very thing that you said you would never become? We repeat our parents' mistakes because that's all we know. And yet, when Jesus blows that all up and puts us on level ground, he teaches us a new way. And he could teach you a brand new way. That's how he destroys it. He partners with you and I. I'm not gonna get to any of my message. Go ahead and stand up. I'm just not gonna do it. I'll give you the slide, though. Jesus came to destroy the works designed to cripple your life. Some of you are still limping around because of some things that happened to you or some things that you did. In the process, it's wounded your view of who you are. And yes, those things really happen, but as you limp around, you'll never be able to run 
on your own, but Jesus can heal that, can cure that, can fix that. And some of it will happen right away. And some of it will happen over time with hard work and some tears and some counseling of other people. So one thing about Jesus is he's diligent about helping you navigate to health. And sometimes when that happens, we just wanna run away and clog our ears. And I love when people come to the church like, this is the greatest place ever, greatest place ever. And then as God begins to dial in on maybe an area of their life and God uses an individual to dial in on that area, I'm out, who are you to say anything? I'm out of here. You know, the greatest thing that you found has two sides that are very valuable to it. It's here to be a blessing to you and it's here to, help, to be assistance in partnership with God to help you navigate to the best version of you. Yeah. And if you could do it on your own, you would have. Yeah. Yeah. Am I saying it with a smile? Because yes. I, I, he's had to do it to me. I've had my pastor talk to me. Hey, Steve, you didn't really say that, did you? Yeah, I said that. Steve, you, you hear how that sounds? I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, should I tell, oh, no, I shouldn't tell you my own sin. I had some people. No, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I literally said one time to another pastor who said to me, those people don't want you to succeed. I said, yeah, well, the biggest middle finger I can give them is success. It sounded really brash and cool when I said it. I'll show them is really what I was trying to say. But that pastor went and told my pastor what I said. He said, Steve, did you really say the biggest middle finger you could give to your enemies was your success? I said, yeah, I said that. He said, did you really say that? <laughs> yeah. Did you really say that? Yeah. Anybody who've done stupid stuff like me? Mm. Just don't ever admit it on the scale and not on digital so that, anyways, okay. The enemy has come to break down the constructs that are keeping you from thriving. He's come to tear down the, 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 the handcuffing to the, to the memory of your past. He's come to rip down the structure you feel trapped in that repeats the cycle of sin over and over. You say to yourself, why do I keep doing this? Because you keep trying to stop. Trying to stop is not gonna work. Surrendering your life to Jesus and being empowered by him and his word will be the thing that blows up this construct. I just wish this stuff would just go away. It's not gonna go away, but it says you step into God's presence and you invite God to dissolve the hardness of your heart, your unforgiveness, that's when it will dissolve away. You've got a role to play, but you're not gonna do it on your own. It's when you and I invite him in to surrender, amen? Amen. 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 Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and someday... We will all behold him. We will watch the destruction. And I don't know that there'll be celebration. I think we'll be brokenhearted for what has been accomplished. But at the same time, we will celebrate the victory of our king and that we experience ourselves. But you and I don't have to wait till that day. We get to be a part of that right now. And if you will say yes to Jesus and begin to lean in, I promise you some of those restraining constructs are gonna begin to fall away. Some of them are gonna break off right now as we pray, and some of them are gonna be a process. But Jesus didn't come so you can have a best friend. Jesus didn't come just to forgive your sin. Because if he came to forgive your sin, the devil will continue to work his works in your life till the day you die. He came to destroy the works of the devil in your life today. To destroy them, to dissolve them, to cause them to release you in Jesus' name. If you believe that, hands raised. We're gonna pray together as a church family. I pray over you. I'm gonna look you in the eye. You don't have to bow your head. You don't have to close your eyes. Father, we thank you for sending your son. Maybe a boy in a manger, an infant, a small child, but wow, he came to destroy the one who held all of the nations in his hand, their power and their glory. He came to undo that and establish a new kingdom with a new king who loves us, who honors us, who helps us, who wants life, not death, destruction, and suffering. And so today, fresh and new, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come on, say that with me. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. I surrender it, Lord. You've got better things for me. I, I 
I reject the prince of the power of the air. I reject the God of this world. I reject that one who was thrown from heaven to earth. I say yes to Jesus and I step into the kingdom of heaven on this earth. And Father, I invite you to, to dissolve. I invite you to unleash. God, I invite you to tear down the things that have been erected in my life to keep me from experiencing all the goodness that you came to give your life for. I invite you to destroy the works of the devil in my life. Come on, pray that with me. I invite you to destroy the works of the devil in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a big hand. Thanks for being with us today. Be sure to like and subscribe and visit us at c3swwa.com for more information about our church. 